might hate this, but I think the whole field of cognitive biases is missing the point. Like Love I think it. we Love have it. we have these biases because they're um, like overconfidence is is really you know you or confirmation bias is the easiest one to understand actually. Mm -hmm. Like you see the data that supports your your art your you know previous conclusion. Yeah, yeah. Why? Because you don't want to find out you were wrong. Why don't you mm -hmm. find out you're wrong? Because you're going to be disappointed and like maybe embarrassed. Mm -hmm. So you literally, all you do is delay the disappointment and embarrassment. But you you want to find stuff that justifies what you've already said or the position you've already put on. Why? You're, you're literally trying to avoid disappointment and embarrassment. Welcome to the Rose Show podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. I have the pleasure of being here with Denise Scholl. She's founder and CEO of Rethink. She is a performance strategy and decision advisor. She has a background in neuroscience and modern psychoanalysis. She's also an author and a speaker, and she's a pretty awesome speaker as well. You challenge conventional thinking and wisdom. You rethink decision-making. How are you doing today, Denise? I'm well. Happy to be here. Thank you for awesome. having me. Thank you so much for being here. So how's Park City? You still have snow over there? Are we see these snow pictures. We do still have snow. It's July 19th. I mean, it's <laughs> only at the very top of the mountain, but there's still snow up there. So oh, it's amazing. I mean, it was like a record year, so I'm not surprised, you know? I mean, it was 92 here the other day, so like it has to be pretty hot at the top of the mountain, but I guess there was just so much snow up there that there's still some up there. Are you a skier? I am. I wow. like, yeah, yeah. Well, that's how I ended up in a ski town. <laughs> that's awesome. It works perfectly. And it's beautiful. The weather there is gorgeous. I love that dry weather out there. Um, Denise, you know, you provide a forward thinking, very fresh perspective on decision making you, you challenge conventional thinking of you know we need to suppress our emotions and actually change the whole dynamic of decision making so I you, you really it's the importance of thinking different and rethink and I love that name of your company so I'd like to begin with you telling us about your show method I know mm -hmm. it leverages the latest in neuroscience and psychological research into perception and judgment, which are key for decision making. Yeah, yeah. So it's an amalgam, I guess it's called, amalgamation, amalgam, of like what I learned at IBM in terms of like strategy and tactics in decision making. What I've just learned in neuroscience about how we really make a decision, which at the end of the day, it's always based on how we expect to feel. We feel a certain way, but it's really got this expectation in it. Um, and modern psychoanalysis, which is psychoanalytic, you know, evaluating one's unconscious, but not so much Freudian, at least the moderns are not so much Freudian in that they're not doing this kind of, well, you're doing this because your dad did that. That's called interpretation in Freudian. And the moderns are not big believers in interpretation. They think that like oftentimes if you interpret, it's like too hard for one to hear. And you can also know you do these things because but it doesn't help you change them. So they're more about creating a new emotional experience. I attempt to do that, but I do also somewhat interpret. So it's the fact that it's this combination of, you know, strategy and tactics that I learned at IBM, which is kind of like business school, you know, which is what neuroscience teaches. And then a little bit modern with this new emotional experience, but I will interpret plenty of times, partially because people want me to, but also when I interpret, it's not so much you're doing this because, you know, your dad did that. It's more like, well, let's think about how you felt when your dad did that and what that made you think and how does how you feel now compare. So it's a, the reason we ended up calling it the shell method is because it's a little bit of each. You know, I used to say it was modern psychoanalysis applied to, to risk decision making, but you know, I, I started doing it a little bit more my own way and we thought it needed a name. 
Well, I love it. And I think it's much simpler and cleaner. And shell method is cool. And I think it sticks pretty well. You know, it's like a hybrid method, an interdisciplinary approach, which is what decision making really is. I mean, decision sciences involves an interdisciplinary study. So how appropriate. And it's about asking about how you feel. And it's always that that self-awareness of understanding our emotions and feelings, which are key. So I want to know about your background and how you came to this show method. Now, I know you have a little bit of trading. You have this IBM. You have psychology, neuroscience. You have like a blend of everything. If you could just give us a simple progression of time and how you came to where you are today, we'd love that. The one thing I hardly ever say that's sort of funny is I have an undergraduate degree in biology and nutrition. Like I thought I was going to be a dietitian. Like, and then when I was doing, like I had to do an internship and I was like, oh my God, if I end up having to tell people what to eat, I'll, you know, that'll just, <laughs> that'll be awful. And so I, IBM used to hire, they didn't care what you majored in. They looked for more like a personality type. So I was like, oh, that'd be good. You know, the business the business world, an Amex card, travel, like don't have to be in the office. So I thought I was going to climb the corporate ladder at IBM. And then in fact, I was scheduled to take a leave of absence and go to Stanford Business School. And I thought, if I wake up when I'm 40 and my job is like to sell progressive insurance, because that that was my account in Cleveland, Ohio, another mainframe computer, I'll have to like slip my wrist. Not, I mean, you know, like who could possibly care whether progressive insurance buys another mainframe computer other than IBM executives? Um, so I quit and went to Aspen for the winter with the objective of figuring out which town, Chicago, um, New York, or Boston, I wanted to live in in order to go to graduate school in something in psychology. So I ended up in Chicago um, and University of Chicago has a design your own master's program. So I did that and I ended up dating a trader as one does in Chicago, because there's a whole bunch of floor traders or there used to be. Um, he thought I would be a good trader. Eventually he got me into the trading. The PhD went by the wayside. Um, then I moved to New York to run trading desk, actually after trading my own on my own for a few years. And I did start studying in a little institute of psychoanalysis, which I could have kind of gotten my PhD through, but it, you know, it was, I wasn't really planning on it. And this was, well, I started there in 2000, but in 2003, I guess it was, they asked to publish my master's thesis, which at that point was like eight or nine years old. And they were doing a, a issue on like the neuroscience of psychoanalysis and my master's thesis is such. And I was like, you guys are psychoanalysts and you're gonna look kind of stupid if you publish this old paper. But I'll update it because I thought it would be kind of cool to have a paper published in a little academic journal, even if it's like the least known academic journal on the planet. And so when I went to like update some of the research, primarily Antonio Damasio, who's now at University of Southern California, but he wrote a book, for example, he's written a number of books, but one that's well known is called Descartes' Air. Descartes saying, I think, therefore I am. Well, the air is, I feel, therefore I am. And I was like, all the trading and investing is causing take the emotion out of it, take the emotion out of it, take the emotion out of it. But as it turns out, or this is what I thought 20 years ago, it literally was the summer of, of 2003. Um, if you could do that, if you could, which you can't, despite what anybody that thinks, you couldn't make a single decision. And so I just started talking about it. Like I was, I was trading at a prop firm and I just started talking about like what this stuff was showing. And then somebody said to me, you need to write an article for like a trading magazine. And I just laughed. I was like, oh yeah, like, right. Like who's going to publish an article by me? Well, it turns out this person worked for a famous trader and was trading in our office under a false identity. And I knew him as one, I knew him as Izzy. His real name was Chris. And so then he confessed to being Chris and confessed to being close to this famous trader who had written lots of articles for lots of magazines. So he knew lots of editors. And he's like, I'll hook you up with an editor. So then I wrote this article called Freud's Path to Profits, which came out in December of 2004. And then, like you were saying about your podcast, it took on a life of its own. Like, I just talked about what the science was saying about emotion and perception decision making. And people started saying, oh, that makes so much more sense to me. Or that's how I do it, but I never told anyone. Or, you know, 
Like, and so it really, I often say I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the people who started saying it made sense to them. Wow. Um, I have to tell you the next line, actually the next topic I was going to, I had Antonio Damasio's quote. And that's exactly what I was going to read to you to start the whole emotional section. Uh, so it's amazing you said that because I love him and I think he's amazing. And yeah, this is amazing how it called you and it just clicked and and here you are. And I think it was much needed and we needed to think different. And this was, you know, it's like the flat earthers, right? It's the people who thought different, the ones who said, no, you know, and they questioned them. They said, the world is round, you know, and it's like you were that person that that actually you gave people what they really needed. And this is, it, it, it's the way they had that the way we made decisions is not really how we made decisions. They keep saying, we need to remove the emotion. We need to be objective, but we're feeling beings. We're emotional beings. And I'm going to read you his quote, which I know you know very well. We aren't thinking machines, rather feeling beings that think. So right. the fact that you spoke about, it, you wrote about it, and you've launched this entire beautiful science on it, the Shull method, and um, is much needed. So this is great. Um, this is awesome. I love it, Denise. I mean, in some ways, you asked me my background. You know, it was that, I mean, I grew up an only child. Me I was too. never crazy emotional, but I mean, I had a lot of emotions, Um and nothing ever, anyone ever said to me about them actually made any difference. So part, I can remember one time I was sitting in Akron, Ohio, so where I grew up, about to turn left on the highway with my best friend at the time, we were maybe 20 at the time. And she said, well, you know, if you stand up straight and smile, you're going to feel happy. And I, I was in the driver's seat and I was like, yeah, right. Like maybe for 27 <laughs> nanoseconds, you know, like I just didn't buy the stuff. So when I started to see research, I mean, part of it was just making sense of me you know to me really like and making sense of the advice that I got or you know things that people said about emotion that just didn't seem real to me I mean even when I very first started trading I was telling somebody this yesterday uh I had two guys who sat in front of me and they both came off the floor one traded for AIDS at the time because stocks traded in AIDS and he was as quiet like you know he could go for days and you never hear a peep out of him and then all of a sudden the desk would erupt. Pencils would go everywhere. The chair would fly like, you know, and basically he had lost an eighth, which he hardly ever did. And then there was this other guy and he made money, but then there was this other guy across the office, Steve. And Steve was constantly jumping up and down, you know, swearing, blah, blah, blah. And Steve printed money. And I used to be like, I'd read the books, you know, take the emotion out of it. And I'd think about Steve and I'd be like, you know, I, it didn't, I didn't know that was 10 years before Damasio, I read Damasio, but like. Yeah, you started questioning. It's like you saw that around you and it's something that you, it just felt right with you. And that's how it begins. We begin with ourselves first and then we can move on to others. Um, I want to get into your thinking on the emotions in the decision-making and break it down. Now, okay. emotions and feelings give us very important information about ourselves. Now, everyone is always so concerned as we're going to talk about trading. I think that's an important part is everyone always says you, you've got to eliminate the emotions because the emotions disrupt the decision-making. However, our emotions, like you have, like you always, like I, all your great reading, I, I write, read about you. It says that the emotions are integral part of your decision-making and decision-making is made in your subconscious. So how do we separate that assessment and, and asking ourselves how we're feeling and checking in with ourselves from the act, from the respond, the reaction of acting from those emotions? Well, before I say how, I'm gonna say it's a great question because it brings up the point that most people miss. The control your emotions is a mistake. What they really mean is control your actions. Like they see someone get emotional, you know, mm -hmm. and then the person acts on those emotions. So they think the problem is the emotion because if they didn't have the emotion, they wouldn't do the action. The problem, like you could be as emotional as you want about mm -hmm. anything. If you don't act on it, nothing happens. Exactly. So like an emotion alone never pushed a key 
Like you have to take the action, but historically they've been conflated. So that's where the problem is actually. It's like control the action, understand the emotion, control the action. So basically it's just been this mass confusion. Now, are all emotions giving you information about the decision you need to make? No. Like at its core, our brain, our psyche is trying to keep us personally safe. You know, and that means physically safe. It also means like emotionally and socially safe. So things like embarrassment or shame or whatever. So what you want to do is get more aware of which feelings and emotions. And I only think the difference is intensity, by the way. But which ones are about you? What's going to happen to you? Versus which ones are about the problem at hand? Like, what's your sense? Like, what's your sense of your analysis? How much confidence do you have in the conclusion of your analysis? We make the, we do the thing based on the feeling about the analysis, not the analysis alone. The analysis gives us some piece of information that we have a feeling about, and then we choose whether to act out that feeling or not. But I always say, like, so Jennifer Lerner of Harvard says, integral, is it integral mm -hmm. to the decision or is it incidental? Now, if it's incidental to the decision, let's just say it's a trading or a market decision, that doesn't mean it's incidental to your whole life. It might be important to your whole life. Like it might be important to who you are and your self-image and what you want in the world. It just has nothing to do with this decision. So I say, look, you first of all, I've got to under, you've got to recognize them, understand them, which is research them, then assign them. Like, is this about me or is this about the decision I'm trying to make? and use the feelings that are about the decision you're trying to make. Now that's easier to do if you can more neutralize the ones that are just about you and your future safety or you know what people might call your ego. But how do you do that? You neutralize much by recognizing what they're about like and just what's called emotion differentiation. Like this is how I feel about that. You know, I'm worried. I mean, this is forever true in professional portfolio managers. I am worried that I'm not, I mean, they're not gonna take this trade. I'm not gonna get out of this trade. I'm not gonna get big enough in this trade or, or I'm not gonna get out, whatever, because it's going to look bad and I'm going to be embarrassed. Not because I made or lost more money, but because how it's gonna make me look. Was I smart or not? Was the thing I pitched to the team right or not? Like that's your own personal safety in a social sense, right? Well, you don't wanna, that doesn't have anything to do with what the price of the stock is going to do. So if you embark on the path of, first of all, accepting, like being willing to feel your feelings and then trying to realize you even have them and research them and then categorize them to use Jennifer Lerner's words, incidental or, or integral to use mine, like information or irrelevant. And it's a, it's a skill. I mean, it, you know, it's a, mind body endeavor and some people can do it relatively well right away because they aren't so defended and they just didn't know they were supposed to do it meaning they haven't been really trying not to feel their feelings they just have you know not necessarily been trying to use them as data some people are really defended and they've spent their life trying to not feel their feelings and so it's harder for those people um but again, it's like at the end of the day, you just want to know which feelings and emotions are about the thing you're trying to decide and which are about some other thing that's not irrelevant to you, but not about the thing you're trying to decide. Exactly right. Now, emotional granularity is key mm -hmm. as well. And, you know, differentiating our, our feelings causes us to have better decisions. However, how do we build that skill of emotional granularity? It seems that many people aren't in touch and then we've been conditioned to seem in society to suppress, to think our emotions are irrational. Is it something like a muscle that we can build? Is this like practice or these skills that we can build and identify, understanding these feelings in order to get this information and also the integral versus the incidental emotions. It's key to distinguish the two. Can we build those skills in identifying and differentiating? I surely think so. I mean, ironically, you use cognitive skill of language to do it. I mean, like lang attention, first of all, paying attention to your body, like what, you know, what's your body telling you? And what's the right word for it? 
And so like I have clients write down every emotion they can think of, like, because I want to get them used to working with the words, like, and then differentiating between, let's say, you know, concerned, worried, afraid, panicked, and like, okay, which is which, you know, like, what's the level of intensity? So differentiation is like knowing the difference between fear, frustration, and disappointment, for example. Granularity is like different degrees of fear or different degrees of frustration. Um, so I have people work with both. Um, and it's surprising sometimes. Here's a really common one. People think they're afraid and they're really actually angry. Um, but they don't know it until they start to, to try to examine it and test. You know, like, does this word click? I mean, does this word seem like it's the right word? Everybody has that experience where they, they're they or somebody they know like just nails the exact right word for anything, you know, the color of blue, whatever. Is it powder blue or, you know, I don't know, midnight blue. Like, and there's a sort of satisfaction we get about getting the exact right word for something. Um, hence some of the popularity of board games, but like you can do that with emotion words. So practicing with them, getting, you know, like, like actually this morning I was golfing and these people I was golfing with were like, oh, you know, all this positive thinking stuff. I said that, I, I'm like the hell with that. I said, like, I'm afraid I'm going to screw the shot up. And they're like, <laughs> she's actually so afraid. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, but like, I know that being able to say that actually lowers the chance I screw it up. Yeah. That increases it because I'm giving voice to that feeling that's telling me to pay a lot mm -hmm. of attention and to be careful. And it's like when you give a word, when you use your cognitive ability of attention and language to give a word to a feeling or emotion, it is, I don't know this and research doesn't know this. And I mean, there's some tiny little bit of research showing language neurons infuse our, you know, all of our organs, but we really don't know why. But it seems to me that your unconscious mind is satisfied that your conscious mind understands the situation and it kind of calms down. And then your conscious mind can execute what it's capable of executing. Like, I mean, like in my case, like the golf shot, you know, like, can I, can I see the club hit the ball, which is my secret to golf for me personally. Um, but yeah, it's working with the language. And the more you do it, I mean, now there's this piece of being willing to do it. And, you know, I'm forever giving my clients homework that amounts to like, well, think about the situation with no judgment because everybody judges their feelings. Mm -hmm. I had a client a couple of months ago. I can't, I can't remember exactly what the situation was. But I advised, it was a Thursday and I advised them, to, it was something they opened their own hedge fund in the past couple of years. You know, they have a team that works for them now. It's frustrating to have a team, you know, because people don't always do which one. So I advised them to just put their feelings into word about, words about this one particular person who worked for them. Because they wanted to know, how do I get this not to bother me over the weekend? Like I spend too much time worrying about like this stuff and I, I want to like be able to enjoy my family. So then I talked to them the second time on Monday and they did it. Like, I'm really frustrated and I'm really concerned this person's not going to make it. But then they added in, but I shouldn't feel that way, but I'm being too critical. But I'm like, and they're like, well, it didn't work. And I'm like, yeah, because as soon as you admitted to a feeling, you told yourself you shouldn't feel that way. Like you, the clue is to do this in an exploratory research manner with like, what do I find? And I, I guess embedded in there is often the courage to have the feeling because people are afraid of feeling their feelings. They think, they think that, you know, like if you really let yourself feel afraid or you really let yourself feel frustrated that you'll just like, you know, melt or explode or something. You actually won't. The melting and exploding happen more often when you don't feel the feeling and then the feeling gets acted out anyway. And then you have a meltdown or a, an outburst where if you just go, God, I'm really angry about that or I'm really worried about that or like, then it's like, then your cognition could kick in and go, well, this is what you could do or not do or these are your choices. Like, 
if we skip over the information step in the feeling, we do end up acting it out. And oftentimes that's not productive, but it's not the emotion. It's the skipping the analysis of the emotion and the not controlling the action. Exactly. Well said. Um, there's so many excellent points in there. I, I want us to start with the, you know, acceptance, acknowledgement. Those are key. And we've been taught to suppress, but we actually need to do the opposite and identify and understand. I love in your golf, <laughs> how you, you're actually feeding that unconscious part of your mind and saying, you know, you say enough for it to be happy with you, it seems, so that you're able to do the golf shot. And, you know, I, I've always believed that it's important to identify the emotions and just feel them. Otherwise, you're going to suppress them and they're going to cause way more problems in your life. There was a book I read many years ago called The Solution. And it was a, a book about, you know, um, about diet, but it was about the mental part of it and how you actually eat based on emotions. And so she had spoken, the author, I'm sorry, I don't remember her name, but she had spoken about how you need to feel the emotions, let them rise to you, and then they dissipate. And by that occurrence, you notice that you don't have that drive to eat. And that was about over the overeating drive. And so yeah. and this is many years ago. And I, that's what got me started on thinking this. And then, you know, going into the studies and the cognitive studies, and then Dr. Lerner, integral versus incidental. And then you also took it a step further. I love how you say informational or irrelevant, and then intuitive or impulsive. And that's yeah. a very important concept as well in trading, in all decision making. Right. We want to, we always like to think we're making decisions from the gut and we want to say it's intuition, but how do we distinguish the intuition from impulse? Yeah. So intuition is generally just a sense of what's right. And it doesn't necessarily have any urgency to it. It's, it's like, it, it feels like recognition without um, energy to act, where impulse always says like, oh my God, I gotta do this, I gotta do this, I gotta do this, I gotta mm -hmm. do this. I mean, occasionally intuition will be, I gotta do this, like when something really truly is time sensitive, but most things aren't. Uh, most things can at least, you know, you can at least take a few minutes, if not much longer. But I, I don't know any other way to say it, but intuition is just this like, it's like when you rec when you see someone's face, you recognize. What's that feeling? Like you see them out of context. Oh my gosh, you know, there's my friend Lauren at high school, you know, at the concert and I haven't seen her in 20 years or whatever. Like think about that feeling. That's a very similar to intuition. You see a set of circumstances that you recognize what it is. You don't have to, you know, go crazy. You don't, you don't feel like, oh my God, I have to do something. You just feel like you recognize something. Impulse is you really want to do something. You feel like if you don't, it's dangerous. It's act, act, do, 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 do. You know, so if it's agitated, if it has got a lot of energy around it, you got to really make sure it's not impulse if you want to make the best decision. Love that. So it's that time issue. It's if you feel rushed, if you had that urgency feeling, you really should stop and think and question and understand that feeling because it's most likely impulse. Um, unless, I mean, unless it really, you know, like, I mean, like, you know, if your child's about to run out of the street and you just oh. grab them, like, you know, if it's yeah. time sensitive, you got to just go with the feeling like, it, you know, it's a combination of intuition and impulse, like, but it's, but if it's not like an emergency Give yourself the space to to try to ask, am I am I recognizing? Like, yeah. Lots of times for me now, I get an intuitive feeling and I don't know what it's about or why, but I just listen to it. Like I, I don't, I don't even bother. It's very easy for you know educated adults to override their intuition. Because what their intuition tells them to do is not the thing they want to do. You know, like you want to send an email or you want to say a certain thing in an email, like, or, but you just have, you know, if you listen, you go, oh, it's not going to do any good if I, so I just don't now. I just don't. 
Like, and I don't even bother to think about it anymore. It's like, okay, I have that feeling. I'm just not doing it. And I hear clients all of the time. You know, you hear people all the time say, well, I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. I didn't listen to myself. Like I have a new client, you know, big famous hedge fund comes from a big famous bank criticizing himself. Can I do it? I could do it at the bank. Can I do it at the hedge fund? It's a different kind of job. It's like two sides of the same coin. And I'm really not sure I'm good enough, really not sure I'm good enough. But when you go through the detail, what the why he's like maybe superficially not good enough right now is because he hasn't been listening to himself. He's been like, he's been overriding what he really thinks. And I'm like, I, I'm like, the irony of that is you're questioning whether you're good enough for the hedge fund side of the business. But the problems you've had are driven by you doing what other people have been pushing you to do as opposed to what you think you should do. So if you had done what you think you should do, like if you had listened to your intuition, your 2023 P&L would be in a different place. But you didn't trust yourself because you weren't sure. So you were nervous and insecure. So you listened to the boss who didn't know a wits about trading whatever, the British pound. Yeah. So there was this irony of, you know, I don't really know what I'm doing. I can't trust my intuition. But, but when you went through the sequence, it was not trusting this person's intuition that got them into a bit of a pickle. And I hear that all the time. I mean, like every day, every day. It's simple, but not easy. It just seems so clear. Like we should just stop and almost like talk to ourselves, our inner selves and find out what's really going on, how we're feeling. And that's why I know you're a proponent of journaling. And it's important to write down these feelings and emotions that we feel. And then we can keep a record and we can understand, you know, once we're more experienced with the process, maybe we don't need to as much. I like to ask you how you coach with performance in sports and how it differs or is similar to trading? Mm. Well, most athletes have been absolutely steeped and I have to be positive. I have to feel confident. I have to think I can win. And generally what happens to them is they can't really think confident like, and they really question whether they can win. And then they think, well, what's wrong with me? Because I'm supposed to be able to think positive and believe I can win, but I can't really. But I also can't tell anybody <laughs> because if I tell anybody, they're going to go like, no, 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 you have to be confident. Yes. We can't just, who can click their fingers and create confidence? I mean, really. So then the athlete has two problems. They have the original, like, you know, normal, like it's hard to compete at any sort of level, right? And like, so you have the normal worries and then you have the secondary voice going, yeah, and something's also wrong with me mentally because I can't just be confident, which is not true. You've been given bad advice. So most of the time when I first work with a professional athlete, it's literally undoing that. Like, forget all that. Like, you're afraid because your brain wants to make sure you're prepared. You're afraid because this is a big deal. You're afraid because like, if you do win this, you go to the next level or you win this much money. Like, of course. The fear, or it, maybe it's just anxiety, is telling you, like, this is really serious. Are you completely prepared? Is there anything you've missed? Like, that's the message you need to take from it. And it's natural. I mean, it's completely natural. Like, so the first level is always undoing all of the conventional wisdom. And then it's helping them get comfortable with, you know, I'm afraid, or I'm worried, or I'm concerned, or I'm really mad I screwed that up, and just letting them have their feelings and put their feelings into words so that they process them and one doesn't bleed to the next. I was recently talking to someone who cares a lot about professional baseball. And he said to me, like, but how does this fear, frustration, and disappointment thing, like, how does it play out on the field? And the, I, I, took the question to me, yeah, I get they might be fear, afraid or frustrated or disappointed, but I'm assuming when they go on the field, they're just going to be professional baseball players, like, and they're going to leave that in the locker room. I think that's what the question really meant. And I'm like, okay, they made an error. They're disappointed in themselves. Like, they've come out the next day and said, you know, I'm not going to make that error again. Like, but their teammate makes an error, you know, and then they're frustrated because maybe they did better, but the team lost 
you know, and then they're like, they start to get worried. Like, is our team going to do well or not? Like and I said, and while they're on the field, having those feelings, they are one half second behind the ball. Like the ball goes through their legs or whatever. He's like, oh, <laughs> it's just like, did I really just have to explain that? Like, like it's, it, it interrupts your focus. Like if you have these emotions, you're trying not to feel and they're there. You're not as focused. So if you're not as focused, I mean, in baseball, the ball's coming at you pretty quickly. Like you don't have a half a second to lose. Um, so it is just like getting to the point where they're okay with those emotions, getting to the point where they can just feel them in real time to neutralize them actually, like while they're actually in competition um, and repeating that. And then they start finding out that they can play afraid. They can play angry. A few years ago, I gave a talk at a professional sports gig and I it was all these coaches and stuff. And I said, look, anything you want from your athletes, you can have through a different approach to their negative emotions, their fear, their frustration, their disappointment. So I give the whole talk, this English guy in the front, of course, English, right? Raises his hand and says, which emotion is the most important? And I was like, Geeks. this is one of those. <laughs> I said to myself, should I tell them the truth or not? And I'm up on the stage and I'm like, I say to myself, oh, hell, just go for it. Because the most important one is anger. So I say anger. The English guy, you can tell, is like, does not want to talk about anger. I don't know how it goes. The talk ends. And I say to my husband that night, it was really good, but I shouldn't have said anger. It was just too much for the audience to hear that. The next day, we're getting in the elevator. This guy says, oh, my God, your talk was so great. It was so great. Like, I'm such and such for the Washington Nationals. And I'm like, yeah, but I shouldn't have said the anger thing. I think that he goes, no, that was perfect. Our best pitcher plays angry. Like, I was so happy when you said that. And I was like, okay. <laughs> but well, it's, it's a saying. It's like, let's change your opinion about your emotions. Like, they're not bad. Like, they have purpose. Let's get you comfortable with having them. You feel what you feel. Like, the, the fastest way to change how you feel is to accept that you feel that way. It's not to try to change it. It's not to tell yourself to feel different. It's not to tell yourself you've won 19 gold medals and so you'll be fine today. It's not. Your cognition does not work because the feeling is trying to get some basic message to you and it your, your psyche wants to know you've got that message. So like a lot of people know that I've coached this snowboarder, Lindsay Jacob Ellis, who in 2006, in her first Olympics, snatched silver from gold by celebrating too early. And so she went, you know, to two Olympics, three Olympics, four Olympics, couldn't, she underperformed at the Olympics. I mean, she had a, an Olympic mental block. And as good as she was, I mean, she won World Cup, she won World Championships, you know, but the Olympics, the X Games, but the Olympics, because of that first mistake, you know, she was psyched out about it, to use a generic term. Well, one thing I got her to do is when she's in the gate, it's snowboard racing and they pull themselves out of the gate and then they go down this course, you know, going every which way. I'm like, she's like, I've never been good at the starts. I'm like, well, what does it feel like to be in a start? No, oh, she didn't really know. I'm like, I would assume you're kind of afraid. I mean, snowboard cross racing is actually dangerous, even though no one almost ever gets hurt. But I mean, it's a miracle that more people don't get hurt. I'm like, well, if you're afraid, just say you're afraid. She, of course, went through that. I can't do that. Oh my God. But she did it. And she started getting out of the gate faster. It was the same thing that I said to the baseball guy. When she wasn't trying to ward off the fear, like there wasn't this static energy that was actually slowing her pull down. When she just accepted that she could use those biceps and pull herself out of that gate faster. Um, so it's really, it doesn't matter who I'm working with. It's like, it's always it's the same in terms of steps. Mm -hmm. It's not the same in terms, like I don't have a piece of paper here that says the Shull Method is these nine steps and I do these nine things. Like I judge the person's where they are, like their willingness. How much do they even know what they feel? You know, are they really completely in their head? Are they rationalizing? Like I judge what a psychoanalyst would call their level of resistance and defenses, but I'm always going for the same thing. Can you have all of your feelings? And for that matter, all of your thoughts and fantasies, that's from my 
psychoanalytic mentor, because I do have a psychoanalytic mentor, you know, he's like, have all your thoughts, feelings, and fantasies without any judgment. And then let's just sort them out for the thing you want. Like, can you have your desire? There's a lot of people who really think desire is bad because it sets you up for disappointment. Desire's like, you gotta have desire to get the, you know, then it's like, that's the thing that motivates you to do the work. So I try to help people use it, regardless of what it is. I mean, I had a hedge fund ask me yesterday what to do with, with a guy who just constantly takes too much risk. And they're like, he's not feeling unsafe. Because I was talking about how like you have, your brain's trying to keep you safe and whatnot. And they're like, he just doesn't feel unsafe at all. I'm like, I mean, I don't know this person yet. I said, but it's got to be that he actually feels safer taking the big risk. I don't know why he does, but I'm sure if we talk to him, we can figure out why to him. I mean, he probably thinks your hit rate is low, you know, meaning you're going to make money three out of 10 times or something. So when you make it, you better make a lot. That's probably what he thinks. Now, his boss doesn't think that's a good idea, but that's almost certainly what the guy thinks. He's not thinking, oh, I'm going to take big risk and blow myself up. That's a good idea. He's not thinking that. Anyway, again, it's like, what are the feelings and what are they telling you and why are they there? And then, I mean, the psychological piece is what's the repetition? You know, what's, what's your life story that gave you an, a self-image that says certain things about you? with an ego that functions in a certain way, meaning an expectation of certain events about. And so let's untangle how that fits from whatever you're trying to perform in. But generally speaking, human beings have some dimension of insecurity. You know, what, whatever, you know, they're not tall enough, they're whatever, they're not smart enough, they're not whatever enough. I mean, it's kind of, I think it's the human condition that everybody has like a strand of that or thread of that. Um, so certain people will overemphasize that sort of normal, excuse me, human insecurity as applied to whatever their challenge is. So after we get through fear, frustration, and disappointment, like the basic, like it's like, okay, and then which pieces of this within you are exaggerated? Because whatever, you weren't as smart as your older sister or whatever, you know, or your dad told you you weren't or what, you know, like mm -hmm. everybody's, everybody's got that stuff. Don't anybody think that no one's got yeah. that stuff? Everyone has, everyone has something. I always say everyone's fighting some battle and that's why they say always be kind, but everyone has something going on and they have these mental blockages, which we need to go through either sooner or later um, to overcome and to, you know, achieve goals in life, any success. I know it's a subjective term, but to achieve what we want. You made some excellent points here. Um, I think there needs to be an alignment in our unconscious and our conscious mind. We need to all have our energies focused on, let's say, your skier, your snowboarder. You know, she had um, this um, fear. Um, she had this, she was afraid. So if she put her mind, her body is putting energy towards those feelings. If she keeps suppressing, denying them, she's holding herself back. And that's why suppressing emotions negatively impacts you in your life and maybe in other areas. And so she wasn't able to break through. And when she finally said, you know what, it's okay. You told her it's okay to feel that way. And I think that's the first step is saying to people, it's okay. You can feel those emotions. It's okay. And once they think, because we've been conditioned in society to be robots, it's like they, we have to be so objective, we can't have any emotions. So telling people it's okay. And then instead of them doing that self-talk and telling themselves, you know, oh, I'm not going to feel this way. They're asking themselves, what am I feeling? So it's about asking questions. And I believe yeah. that's what your method is about asking questions. Yeah. And then the emotional granularity and then identifying differentiating emotions. And I recently read, you must know her, Brene Brown. She wrote, right, yeah. yeah, she's great. And she talks about emotional granularity. And this was an interesting one. She talked about resentment and how most people think it's a function of anger. However, it's actually a function of envy. And I thought that was really interesting how you, how language helps you connect things and identify. So then envy, here we are, now that I brought up envy, envy is a great emotion to help tell you what you really want. So when you have that feeling of envy, 
Maybe it's not that you are an angry person or anything, you wish ill on anyone. It's that you're unhappy with yourself and what you have. So yeah. to experience it, right? And then to have that feeling. I want to go through a recent tweet of yours. Your tweets are brilliant. I love your tweets. Besides the puppy pictures and the snow pictures, you have some really profound tweets. Seems like we okay. think, analyze, and then we do choose. We actually feel first, middle and last. The feelings provide both context and summarize our analysis. And then the key point here, which I like you to expand on is, if you consistently make choices that you're unhappy with, which all of us do, we really need to just go to finding our feelings. Could you tell us about that? Well, if you're consistently making choices that you're unhappy with, you're acting out a feeling that you probably don't want to know you have, but you don't know it. You know, you think that you're trying to use your Oh, your intellect, the power of your intellect to override that feeling. But because of the way the human brain and behavior work, the feeling ends up winning, particularly under stress. So, you know, people in trading will like be disciplined, be disciplined, be disciplined, yes. and then one day just blow up because it's like a balloon, you know, like the feeling gets bigger and bigger and bigger. But then they, that's just, they're just overwhelmed and they act it out at the worst possible moment. So I just know if someone, if someone's consistently doing things they don't want, there's mm -hmm. a feeling driving that, but they're not working with the feeling in the most advantageous way. You know, you can almost certainly assume that they're trying not to have it or not to feel it or literally not act it out. You know, I shouldn't do that again. I shouldn't do that again. I shouldn't do that again. There's like some emotional driver as to why you're doing it. And the better way to do the thing you want is first of all, to identify what you really want. Like mm -hmm. what will actually get you there? You know, those are, that's using your intellect. What do I really want? What will actually get me there? And then what are the feelings I have about getting there, getting the thing that I want? Again, it's the same. Like there is, you know, there's no word for how much information is in our feelings. There's no word for it. Like, intuition at the end of the day is the feeling of an expert you know where they used to have to do it ex ex explicitly and linearly and then the more you do it the more of an expert you come the more it becomes into your body and it's just a sense of how to do things um i mean there are certain talents and whatnot but it, it, like being able to um, play music by year but again that person that could play music by year at one point learned like what the keys were on a piano you know now they can just sense the right keys to play. Like I could never do that, but <laughs> I couldn't do it with the music in front of me. Um, but that's what I meant. Like, like a person can be doing things repeatedly they don't wanna do. And what they're gonna be told is they have to think differently. If think differently includes recognize analyze, understand the emotions, then sure. But that's not usually not what the people mean by think differently. <laughs> you know, they usually mean like think something about yourself differently or think, have more confidence or- Yeah, or be more positive. How about that one? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I literally think it's the curse of the world to be more positive. I, I'm, not, I'm actually not even kidding. Like I think, I think the pressure to be positive has contributed to the mental health crisis. I think it's contributed to the- uh, It's crisis, covering up for- everything you know you can't just say i'm gonna be positive and cover up for all the you know the feelings that you're feeling it's you you don't always feel positive you're not always going to be happy that's not how we are as humans we're meant to feel all these different emotions challenges problems how do i solve them what do i do about this like that's life right we're all constantly yeah, ups and downs a roller coaster right yeah so what happens is people have challenges and problems. They're trying to think how they want to fix it. Maybe they get overwhelmed with how it feels. Sure. Like it feels unfixable and they get overwhelmed and then they're told they have to feel positive. So mm -hmm. now they have another bigger problem. They've literally been told to do something they cannot do that they should not do, but they think it's a deficiency in them. So whatever they have, whatever problem they had, and then they have the idea that they have to be positive and they can't. And so they feel like there's something wrong with them, which does not help anybody solve any problem. Absolutely right. You can't keep covering up the feelings 
and just telling yourself once again, instead of asking yourself how you feel, telling yourself, you know what, I'm going to be positive. I'm going to be happy because that's not how it works. And uh, excellent points there. You mentioned predicting how we like to think that our brain is a stimulus response. However, what our brain really does is always predicting. It's unconsciously predicting. And these expectations that we have when we make our predictions are actually based on feeling. Could you tell us about that? Well, so the latest cognitive science is everything is a prediction. Like we're predicting each other's words now, even like touch and light and that it's all prediction based on based on context. But what you perceive context to be is like all it's the um, accumulation of your learning. So, I mean, I, there's a, a good group of neuroscientists who done really good work, who I think have pretty much, you never technically prove anything in science, but for all yeah. practical purposes, have shown that absolutely the mechanism of perception is, is prediction. The experiment I always tell people to do is have someone hand you either iced coffee or steaming hot coffee in a, in a container that doesn't tell you what it is. And when they hand it to you, you're not going to know whether it's hot or cold, like you would if you knew they were handing you a hot cup of coffee or, or a nice coffee. It will take you like an extra, is that hot or is that cold? Because you can't make the prediction because you've literally been prevented from making the prediction. So you have to like, you do have to get some more input. But what I think is the very best science is Brian Newton out of Stanford, who has shown, he calls it anticipatory affect. You're always anticipating how you will feel. And that is literally mm -hmm. the cornerstone of decision-making. Now you can, you can, you know, model that over, over cognition is safe or not safe. You're always predicting safe or not safe, but like safe or not safe is I feel good. I feel bad. I feel happy. I feel sad. I feel successful, not successful. I feel satisfied, not satisfied, you know, so I find that when you work with people's predictions of how they're going to feel, you're able to help them take different actions a lot more easily because they don't even realize that they're predicting. Like I had a guy who he's been a portfolio manager for like 15 years. Um, he's always kept a bunch of little losing positions on his book and he's tried everything, you know, to get rid of like these little natty positions that end up losing him money and wasting his attention and stuff. And nothing's ever worked. So I'm like, well, what happens if you take them off? Well, I don't know. I might lose money, you know. Well, what happens if you lose money? Well, it's not that much money, so it won't really matter. So what really happens? Well, I don't know. I'll have to call the broker. Yeah, and the broker will think. I'm like, what will the broker think? Well, the broker will think I'm like stupid or a bad trader. I'm like, and literally he went, wait, you got to be kidding me. He goes, and I'll be embarrassed. I'm embarrassed in what the broker will think of me, and that's keeping me in these positions. <laughs> I'm like, I think so, because it seems unsafe. You know, brokers are germane to his business. He's in Europe, he trades currencies. Like, I probably shouldn't have said that, but he's in Europe. <laughs> um, like, he needs the brokers. So if the brokers are going to think that he's, like, not a very good trader or whatever, maybe they won't give him good information. So literally, his fear that of being embarrassed by the brokers was not irrelevant to his future safety. But generally speaking, probably was not really relevant to him making money. And the moment that he realized that what was keeping him in these positions was that he started exiting them while we were still on the phone. Wow. But he never knew before that. I mean, he tried to solve this problem for years. And then it's like, then he could see cognitively that the brokers don't give, you know, the proverbial rat's ass, if you will, like whether he was right. They just want him to call with the next trade so they can charge him a commission and then hang up and hands to the next fund so they can charge the next part. They don't care whether he made money or not. Wow. That's, yeah, you, you focus on the goal. The goal is to make the money. And then he realized that it was based on that and what they thought of him and that's, that's unlocking a mental block. It's like he had it there and he finally was able to release those positions. It's like magic, but it's actually- Well, in a way it is, isn't it? but it was literally exactly what Brian Newton's lab has shown. He was expecting this future feeling hmm. and his choice 
was driven by that expectation of a future feeling. That's and when it. he when he made it conscious, he realized that future feeling didn't really mean anything to him. But the 10 or 15 years he tried to solve it every other way hadn't solved it. Because deep, deep down, what the brokers think of him seemed important. It seemed, you know, it seemed integral. It did. But he didn't know that, you know. But we see I, and it we, happens all the time. Yeah, but when we try to make these these predictions, we can be wrong, right? If we have this expectation of a future feeling that even when we're trying to predict, we could be misaligned. And so we have these feelings and we our prediction is wrong. Can that occur? Wait, well, it's wrong most of the time. Okay. Like, because yeah, it's yeah. back to when we were talking about is the feeling about the problem that Hannah is the feeling about you. Mm -hmm. So that was a feeling about himself. He was going to be embarrassed. I mean, yes, that you could argue that like he needs these brokers to work with him. But generally it was, he was going to be embarrassed. You know, that was what was stopping it. The avoidance of embarrassment, the fear of future regret, you know, don't want to feel bad in the future. That was what was stopping him. That was, it was just about him. Most of the time, the predictions are wrong because they are about us and our self-image. And fear? Like, particularly fear is the root? Well, if, if you take fear of future regret, like, mm -hmm. am I going to, am I afraid that I'm going to regret this in the future? Mm -hmm. That is, I think, is the single most common, powerful, easy to access also. Mm -hmm feeling in portfolio management and trading. It might be in life, but it's definitely in something as uncertain as the markets. Because the truth is you're gonna regret it most of the time. You know, you're yeah. never gonna like get the maximum, you're rarely gonna get the maximum profit out of something. So there's always potential for regret. By definition, by the you know name of the game. If you win a baseball game by one run, it doesn't matter whether you won by one or 10. I mean, other than your statistics might change, but you don't really care at the end of the year. You know, it's a win. It's not like that in trading. You know, you want to you want to get the mat. You want to win by 10. And if you don't, you're going to feel bad. Like the win mm -hmm. takes. And it's always like that. So, I mean, fear of future regret is a, a thing that most people who operate in the markets can try to work on. Like, just find that for yourself. See if you can unpack that. And start to neutralize some of that, and you'll find you're making some better decisions. Absolutely. And then also that losing streak one, that's another tough one coming back from losses. I want to get into that one, but I think I'd like to go to decision making before we get into that part. Now, decision making, I'd like to get into, um, you know, that our goal is to improve the accuracy of our judgments in order to maximize the expected value of our choices. I think that's at the core. We like to do that. Um, however, there are not only feelings there, but there's also the biases and heuristics. You know, we have everything. I, I know you always talk about personal biases based on our past experiences. We have, oh, in the market, there's recency bias is huge. Anchoring bias. Um, that's another one with price targets, recent price targets. Um, there's the overconfidence is the mother of all biases. How do you work with people helping to minimize their biases, whether any of those and their heuristics in making decisions and how do people minimize them in general? And do we identify and remain aware of them? Is that enough? Do we need to go more into a system two thinking with Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, try to you know get out of that system one? Do you believe that's effective? What are your thoughts on all of that? You might hate this, but I think the whole field of cognitive biases is missing the point. Like Love I it. think we Love have it. we have these biases because they're um, like overconfidence is is really, you know, you or confirmation bias is the easiest one to understand actually. Mm -hmm. Like you see the data that supports your your art your you know previous conclusion. Yeah. Why? 
because you don't want to find out you were wrong. Why don't you mm-hmm. find out you're wrong? Because you're going to be disappointed and like maybe embarrassed. Mm-hmm. So you literally, all you do is delay the disappointment and embarrassment. But you you want to find stuff that justifies what you've already said or the position you've already put on. Why? You're, you're literally trying to avoid disappointment and embarrassment. So if you just get comfortable with the potential for disappointment or embarrassment, or you know that's why you're doing it, it gets easier to look at data that doesn't confirm what you've already said or what the position you've already put on. So, you know, Kahneman at the end of that book says something to the effect of, despite all the work I've done with this, there's nothing really I can do about it. (laughs) I mean, that's really a paraphrase, but he basically says that near the end of the book. And it it just doesn't, it's missing the point. It's cognition and behavior. It's thinking and doing when all the good, interesting, powerful stuff is happening on the feeling level. So if you work with the feelings a lot of the biases just either fall away or are so diluted, diluted, you know, not diluted, but uh, diluted, that they just don't matter that much. Like, wow, you're really challenging more thinking. This is brilliant. I love this because everyone talks about biases. How about recency bias? What about that with traders or anchoring to prices? Well, I mean, Recency is like, it's the most familiar feeling because it's what just happened. Feeling again. I love that. Okay. Yeah. So I'm like, you, you think the thing that just happened is going to happen again, because it's like the, it's like the last in first out feeling. So if you just realize, wait a minute, just because that happened the other day, like, I feel like it's going to happen. Literally, you feel like it's going to happen again because it just happened. Like, but because you feel like it's going to happen again, because it just happened doesn't mean it's going to. Unless you realize you feel like that because it just did, like you can't interrupt it. Like, I mean, it's, you know, it's- Feelings I think are the core. It's about yeah, feelings. Yeah, yeah. But that's a last in, first out feeling. You remember the feelings of the things that happened most recently, most easily. You know, you don't have to search back. It just- pops up because that's what just happened. What was the other one you just said? Recency and anchoring. When people anchor to a price and say, oh, this this stock is cheap now because it was trading at this price, or this stock is expensive because it was trading at this price, and they get stuck on these prices, these price levels. Yeah. I mean, I deal with this a lot. You know, I have a lot of long short equity managers who do fundamental analysis and valuation and you know, they've come through MBA programs and analyst training programs and CFA, Certified Financial Analyst Programs that say like a stock's valuation really matters. And so they get anchored on the valuation, like, and it can't, but I mean, you know, I'm forever asking the question like, well, does valuation matter to everybody in the market? Because it doesn't. I mean, machines and momentum traders can care less about valuation. So again, it always is like, okay. And I mean, I have a few clients that I have a hard time around this with because valuation is like a religion, you know, meaning they so believe in the the, the doctrine of valuation. Mm-hmm. And so I'll say, well, how long does it take a stock to get to its true value? I mean, sometimes it's, you know, a minute and sometimes it's a decade. So that will allow them to have a feeling like, okay, evaluate. They are, it is going to get to its, its proper valuation sooner or later. But then they have this feeling like, well, maybe there's a time window in there that they have to think of other things. So, but what you're really saying underneath is like, why does someone believe a price matters? That's a, if you believe something matters, you have a feeling about it. <laughs> like you you feel that price is right love it feeling. so i'll just say like what's making that price right like does everyone else think that price is right because that's who you need i mean that's the thing that traders miss all the time like what they need they, they need to read how other people feel not what they think it's called theory of mind it's the thing of you know like what it matters is 
what other people, like if people think valuation matters or a price on a chart, like the point of the charts is what? It, it's like a, um, it's a graphic of people's perception of different prices. That's why it tells you anything because it's really telling you how other people are feeling about certain prices. And that's what you need. I mean, you need people to have the feelings about the price that, that will drive the price in the direction you want them to go, you want it to go. And by the way, you get better at understanding your own feelings, you get better at understanding other people's feelings. Absolutely. I love that. Everything comes down so simple to the core of feeling. And I always like to think the price of a stock, I'm a fundamentalist as well, and I do a lot of math behind the numbers, but ultimately it's about buyers and sellers. And the price is where the buyers and sellers agree. Same thing in real estate. You can have Zillow telling you something's worth whatever it's worth. But if a buyer is not willing to pay that price, it's not really worth that. You can hold on to it forever and keep thinking of that price. Maybe it'll meet your price one day. But right now, it's where the buyer will pay. And that price is what the value is. And that's my opinion. Yeah, yeah I mean, I know it's true. I mean, I have a piece of land for sale now. And I'm like, it's not worth what we've got it for sale for because it's not selling. Yeah, maybe in time. You just got to find that one person, they say, right? Yeah, I want to talk about risk. Risk is key. Risk management is number one in life and trading and trading mimics life and life mimics trading. So we have this topic of perceived risk versus actual risk and, you know, risk reality. And sometimes we perceive more risk and our risk judgment isn't aligned with what the actual risk is. Now with the market, we don't know. It's uncertain. There's so much uncertainty. Uh, but with we have this strong loss aversion. And that goes back to feeling. We don't like to lose. As humans, we don't like to lose. And I know there's a lot of studies out there. It's fascinating how once we're given something like a timeshare, once we stay at a timeshare, that's why they, they give us these these free vacation places. So we feel we actually own the place. So it's we're more likely to buy it because we were there and we're like losing that place. And that's why they give you that trial before you buy. It's fascinating stuff. So we have this aversion to loss and that goes back to feeling. So how do we properly assess risk? How can we put that perception in alignment with the reality? Do you have any ideas on that and how you coach people with risk? I mean, the thing that comes to mind is what's reality? Um, you know, reality is different for everyone, right? Depending on their resources and their time frame. And um, I do now have a little doggy looking at me from the glass Aww. window there, like, why can't I come in? <laughs> um, it's a really good question. And I'm not sure I know the answer. Um, I mean, I do think risk is very personal. Yes. Like, everything's personal, right? Our like, experience what are is the, personal. <laughs> what are the odds something, anything will turn out the way you want it to turn out in the time frame you want it to turn out? Like, and what are the factors that go into that thing turning out the way you want it to in the time frame you, you want it to. And those are, by the way, in portfolio management, that what I think will happen and what time frame it will happen in mm. is a really big deal. Oh yeah. Because there's so many clients who have like a really good fundamental process, but particularly in this market this year with the kind of interest rate perception sensitivity, Mm -hmm. Every single news report that comes out, either we're stopping raising rates or we're including, continuing raising rates, either we're going into recession or we're not. There's this duality to it. And a lot of them see that and know that's a risk, this either or, either or, either or. But they have suspicions on for like six months in the future where that's been decided. So I try to get them to see, well, you may be very well, like you're probably right for January 24. But what's the road between here and there? Like, what's the risk? Like, can you close your eyes and wait till January? What? How much risk do you feel like you can tolerate? How much volatility do you feel like you can tolerate? Um, but really, what is it? I mean, people are afraid of different things, you know, or they put another way, they're able to tolerate like back to baseball. I mean, you know, a fabulous hitter's hitting 325, you know, that means like 
you know, more than 60% of their time, they're not hitting the ball. Like, why don't baseball players feel badly about losing 65% of the time if they're one of the greatest hitters ever? They don't, because that's the expectation. You know, traders can't deal with that 65, very few can deal with that, being right 35% of the time and wrong 65% of the time. Mm. So I'm, I hate to say it, but it's going to be like, how do you feel about the factors that are contributing to the risk you're taking? What is the risk you're taking? Like, you know, I have a bit of a perfectionist in me. So when I was trading, I either didn't want to lose at all or I wanted to lose very, very little. Like, I knew I had to lose sometimes, but, you know, I essentially never skipped a stop or never you know, dishonored to stop for like years. I actually got better trading when I decided that I would, in certain circumstances, make decisions in real time, like whether that stop was still accurate in terms of time and context and whatnot. Um, so my tolerance for risk changed as I had more familiarity with price action in, in circumstances. So, um, but you're going to think this is kind of funny. I probably, I mean, I say what's the worst that can happen a lot to my clients. Mm -hmm. I like that. But I don't know how much I use the word risk per se. I, I Maybe it's just that it's a given that they're taking risks. But I don't, I don't know. I love that. I, I love that. that. You really rethink the whole trading world because the number one word you always hear in trading if you go over twitter or fintwit they call it it's risk risk management's number one and i always hear the word risk manage your risk and risk reward and everyone talk about risk adjusted returns so as you're coaching your clients i think that's brilliant that you don't use that word i like that that's I don't different. think I did. Now, now I'll be paying it more attention the next couple of days if I, but I don't think I. I like that. That's I mean, cool. they will talk about, you know, I'm risking one to make four, yeah. I'm risking one to make three. And I obviously I know what that means. I was a trader, mm -hmm. but, um, and sometimes they'll say I'm risking one to make one and that does make me nervous. Um, but I don't, because I, I'm literally like, you know, you've heard me say, what am I feeling and why? And I'm doing what are they feeling and why? Like as the coach, I'm doing what are they feeling and why? And do they know what they're feeling? And do they know why they're feeling it? And what question do I have to ask for them to realize accurately what they are feeling and why? So that they then can do more of the thing that they want to do that will get them what they want. I love that. You break down all the constructs. You, you take everything apart and you go down to the core of the feeling. It's always about the feeling. And that's so simple. I love this. This is really brilliant. This is this is like groundbreaking. And I'm so excited for the listeners as they watch this because it challenges not only the neoclassical views of decision-making and the conventional views, but even just the basic trader who talks about uh, all these constructs when it just comes down to your feeling. And your predictions are based in your future expectate your future expectations of future feelings. And this is excellent, Denise. You're you're amazing. You really are the real deal. I have to say, this is really great. I love this. And you have a cool personality too. You're very spunky and cool over there. I want to mention your Market Mind Games. Excellent book. You um, you really break down the uncertainty of the market, the decision making, and I love your approach to risk and how you mention you, it comes down, no surprise, to feeling. And you talk about creating physical energy and then reading other people. And you think about the emotional state of the market, and it's about knowing yourself and how you feel. And you talk about journaling, and then this is key. You get the strategy edge by using that knowledge of yourself to understand others. And then you know when to push and when not to push. Could you sum that up in your mind and what you were thinking when you were writing and you're thinking through that? I don't know what I was thinking when I read that. <laughs> um, 
I love that process. It's excellent. Well, you know, there's actual brain research that shows that the great traders are predicting other people's perceptions yes. and then behaviors. But we're all humans and we are all looking at some version of the same thing. And we all have theory of mind, which is what the skill is called. The mental um, game. So we can use it more than we realize we can use it. Mm -hmm. You know, I've had traders. I mean, one of my greatest stories was a trader named John Netto, um, who is a really great global macro trader. He's not so much in the markets anymore, but um, this was, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago or so. He he was doing this and he built a chart like for what are other players in the market doing, but it was Thursday afternoon, the market was dropping. He got this overwhelming feeling that he had to massively short the S&Ps. Mm. And he realized that feeling was so overwhelming that he should probably buy them. And he did. And that was the bottom. Like, so wow. he basically knew when the price action was making him feel so compelled that that feeling probably meant the opposite of what he thought it meant. And I do have people do that. I have people try to do it and second guess it, which is a problem. Like they'll, they, they'll try to do it. And what they really end up doing is torpedoing their own intuition because they do a very, well, if I'm really thinking this, then I must be wrong. But um, the, there's also research, by the way, that shows people who know nothing about the markets can watch price action. And a surprising number of them are good at predicting short-term price action. Yes. It's because it, it's the prices are a reflection of the people in the market. And it's, a, you know, they get the sense of the pattern and the rhythm, like a dance, you know, like, or the rhythm of a song even though they have nothing, they don't know anything, you know, other than this prices have gone, you know, like, and then is it going to go up or down? They're surprisingly good at it. So, um, you know, I'm probably so far off of what you asked me, but okay. essentially okay. using your own feelings mm -hmm. and, and consciously intentionally thinking about like, why, if I'm going to buy something, why are people going to pay more for it after I buy it? Or why are people going to sell it for less after I short it? Why? Mm -hmm. It's not just because you see that moving average on that chart. Like what's going to, you know, I will say my hedge fund guys constantly talk about positioning, you know, and meaning what are my competitors doing? How are my competitors looking at this? Because they know they need their competitors to like come in after them. And if they're not, you know, if they buy industrials and defensive stocks and they're and they know that everybody's obsessed with tech stocks, they know they got a problem. And I have a few of those this year because um, nobody. Well, not nobody, but very few people thought the tech stocks were going to do the thing they've done this year. But which is go up and up and up some more. But Yeah, I want to ask you about how traders or people in general can come back from losses. I know from having our three sons in chess. When they would lose a game, sometimes they end up losing the next three games in a row. It's like they just kept losing. It was like you have to break that chain. But how do you do that? How do you coach someone out of that losing streak? I tell them to feel all their frustration and disappointment and to write it down and like wallow in it, basically. Um, to, it's essentially in my mind, you're kind of burning it out. Like it does lead you to like, what could I have done differently? You know? Um, but you feel bad, you know, you're embarrassed, you know, you're mad at yourself for making a mistake or whatever. And I think the discomfort of that feeling is meant to turn your attention to what is the thing you could have done to prevent what happened. And if you don't do that, it lingers and it interrupts your confidence. Like the phenomenon of maybe I used, to, I couldn't used, to, I used to be able to do this, but maybe I can't do it anymore. Maybe I've mm -hmm. forgotten how to do it. Yes. It was pervasive. Like maybe I was lucky. Maybe I was never as good as people thought I was. Like there's all kinds of things people say. Um, 
when really they just need to be like disappointed and in the end mad at themselves for whatever they did actually do wrong, like accurately, you know, in retrospect. And, uh, you know, whatever factors are attributed to luck, you know, because sometimes there are. Um, and get what? An accurate, I'm always striving for what's the most accurate sense of reality, ironically, be through how people feel. But there is a grieving process. Whenever you're disappointed, there's some mm -hmm. sort of grieving process. You know, mad in denial, mad at yourself. You know, like I just walk people through it. And, and what they find is it's not so bad to feel bad about a thing that didn't go the way you want it. And it actually shortens it. You know, you think if you really lean into being like mad at yourself or disappointed or whatever, it's going to overtake you and then it's going to last forever, you know, at least weeks to months. And what you find is it lasts for like, you know, hours to days instead of lingering for weeks to months to years. If you just let yourself examine, okay, what really happened? You know, I'm disappointed or I'm frustrated with myself or I'm hurt or I'm angry or whatever. What really happened? Like, where's the feeling coming from? And also, what's the prediction? Because oftentimes, like, you lose and then you think you've lost it and you're you're predicting that you won't be able to do it anymore. Like, you, you're predicting that you can't come back and what that means to you. And that's usually um, exaggerating or amplifying the other feelings. Yes. Exactly. Are you making that prediction again, which is inaccurate? Um, well, you're making it. It's just, what is it? And like, then mm -hmm. like, wait a minute, how truthful is that? You know? Thank you so much for that, Denise. I want to, before we wrap up, I'm going to want you to share with us your website, which is amazing. I have to say there's so much great information on there. It's like a, a session right there, just reading your website. I, I want to ask you about your Twitter profile, where you state, yes, the Billions Boys did indeed use me to create Wendy, beginning with her Ohio hometown, taking them to court a mountain to living an episode. What does that all mean? It means Andrew Ross Sarkin, Brian Koppelman, and David Levy and use me in my book to shape that character. Maybe really to create the character. I mean, there's other, you know. That's fascinating. Maybe not, maybe not completely the idea of a performance coach in a hedge fund but a female hedge fund performance coach in the way that she operated. Like Andrew called me in 2015 and said, I'm working on this drama. I don't know if you know about it. Like, will you help the actress? She asked me if you would help her. And I knew nothing about it at that point. And I was like, what is this about? And I'm thinking, I remember thinking, where should I meet her for a glass of wine? Should I meet her at that Michael's place that like all the entertainment people, I literally, that's what I was thinking. Well, before I knew it, it was a complete bait and switch to be in the writer's room and she wasn't even there. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, that's when I started to know, wait, something about this isn't right. Um, she got there. I was going to leave to uh, cut it short because I didn't want to give them too much without some sort of deal with them. And they were talking about a deal like, you know, will you come to the set? Will you continue to work with Wendy? Maggie is her name. Yeah, um, Maggie. And because she wanted me to stay, she brought up my book and because the book's written in a fictional envelope and I was literally, I was embarrassed in front of a professional storyteller like Brian Koppelman. I say, so just so you know, it's written in a, you know, like a fictional story and I play myself because I just wanted to like, you know, I wanted to be saying, look, I don't think I wrote the greatest fictional story ever, you know, but I wrote this story as a device and I just wanted him to know. He went crazy. What do you mean? It's fiction? How can it be fiction? It's a trained psychology book. I don't get it. How can it possibly be a fiction book? I, don't know. I was like, oh, and so then Maggie starts talking about this article I wrote about Steve Cohen because she was trying, she's still trying to keep me there. And she's trying to diffuse the situation. And Brian's like, well, you said you were leaving, so I'll lock you out. So I like literally had no idea what happened. Well, there's anger I right there. <laughs> he has anger, I guess, right? Well, what I ended up finding, what I ended up figuring out over the years that this went mm -hmm. on is he had been sued for rounders. Oh. He'd been sued copyright for Rounders. You have a much greater exposure of copyright if you copy from a fiction book than you do a nonfiction mm -hmm. book. So as soon as I said fiction, he probably knew that Sorkin used me. Well, he had to have known Sorkin used mm -hmm. me. She is from Ohio. My very first book, page of the book that dedicates it to my dad of Ohio. Her first words are my first words as my fictional character. I didn't know any of that at the time. Um, 
But, and then they made a deal like to try to keep me out of the press so no one would know about me. And I knew that because a CNBC producer told a market, told a PR person that, you know, she'd love to have me back on. I'm a great guest, but it's a longer story, but she cannot have me on. And like all my CNBC and, and press relationships just vanished. I later had a writer from the show call me and say, everything you've said and more is true. Um, so at the time though, that Andrew called me and asked me for help, I did not know that he had used my book and like my existence to write the pilot. That later became very, very, very true, like very clear. And then as you go through the, particularly like the first three or four seasons, first three, mm -hmm. there are scenes and dialogues that you can find in my book, not word for word, because my book's written a little bit, but the meaning, like you take this sentence and then that sentence and then this sentence and then that sentence, it's the same scene as in my book. But the reason I say it was like living an episode of the show is because everything went against me and, you know, like one bizarre thing happened after another or somebody was going to write an article that was favorable to me. And then all of a sudden that person vanished, you know, it's like, and then at the end of the day, we found out that there was an intern in the judge's chambers who was a student of one of their lawyers. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Just. Unbelievable, but flattery. You were that great that they created this amazing character. I just say, I watched the show and I thought the character, and this was uh, a while ago, I, whenever it came out, I thought the character was amazing and I had no idea it was related to you. And I thought this person's awesome. So it's a compliment to you because it's based on you. Really great character. Um, sorry that it happened though, Denise, that's horrible. But just, I guess, I guess we're going to try to see the positive in it and it's flattery because you're so brilliant. Yeah, so yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, would I have preferred to go into court and win? Of course. Of course. Because then there wouldn't be all those people out there who think I'm the crazy woman who thinks Wendy's based on me and the crazy woman who's in billions, because there are plenty of people who think that. Mm -hmm. That would be the upside. Yeah, plus they would have probably had to pay me something. That would have been nice too. Yeah. But at the end of the day, like, in a weird sort of way, I don't even care that much anymore. Like it is like, I should have realized it was going to be just like the show. I had this naive girl from Akron, Ohio, like I'm going to go into court and get a fair hearing. I know. Well, that was never going to happen. That was never going to happen. <laughs> but it is what it is. It's like, I learned a lot about the exactly. real world. I learned a lot about the real world. And yeah. And I, you know, I, when it was all said and done, like, when I made the decision to actually file the lawsuit, um, which it was coming for a long time, like I didn't file till New Year's Eve of 2018. So it had been going on for like three or four years. And I thought to myself, you know, I talk to people about their fears and I help people put on billions of dollars of trades or I help Lindsay Jacob Ellis hurl herself out of that gate. Like what right do I have to do that unless I stand up for myself? Mm -hmm. So I, in the end, wouldn't have been able to live with myself if I hadn't tried to stand up for myself. That's beautiful. You did the right thing then. And maybe you should write a book about this. I'd love to I have people it. tell me that all the time. Write a book about your experience. Yes. Have somebody make a movie about yes. what happened to you. Yes, I would love that. I if think I had more wonderful. time, I would. I know, we never have time, but I totally support you, Denise. You're awesome. You are an awesome woman. I have to say, I'm very impressed. Oh. You're a cool person too. That's the key. You're not only brilliant, but you're very cool. And I had oh. a lot of fun today. I want to just read one brief tweet of yours. This is beautiful. And this is for all the people out there. It's so inspiring. Try self-compassion instead of critiques and directives. Find and accept the emotional logic of the behaviors that you want to change. We often screw up for reasons that are outside conscious awareness. Be curious, not judgmental. That's beautiful. Thank you so That's much. That's my like, life's mission. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much for that. Tell us about your website and your coaching your amazing e-learning, which is anyone can access it. They don't have to be in Park City and your training and workshops, please. Yeah, so the the um, website is therethinkgroup.net because it turns out there's actually a lot of rethink groups in the world <laughs> um, in advertising and human resources yes. and Sunday school. Um, so it's .net. It's got on there 
you know, information about me and my team. I do have a, a group of guys who coach for me who have all former clients who've now been trained by me and my mentor, um, modern psychoanalyst. Um, we built an e-learning course. I used to have a whole suite of courses. I mean, people that have been around me for a long time knew I had a whole suite of courses like in the mid 2000s. And then I finally decided, okay, it was time to update the science. The basic information is the same and make it an accessible format. So there's an intro to the trader brain. It's really, it could be an intro to the portfolio manager brain. It could be an intro to the risk manager brain. I mean, it's targeted towards traders, but it's basically like, what's the science of everything I've said today and what can you do with it? Um, hey, everyone, it's for everyone. To me, this is unblocking you know, issues in life. This is for everyone. That's my take. It's not yeah. just trading. Yeah, I need to make a ver I need to make a version that is like is more obviously for everyone. But I'm actually working on a second book awesome. called the Emotion Ten. It'll be called the Emotion Paradox. Oh, tell us. Um, oh, wow, cool. Well, it's basically this for the general audience. Like, you know, the key to getting what you want is a different approach to your so-called negative emotions. And here's why, you know, you don't have to feel guilty. You don't have to feel guilty about being afraid or feel guilty about being frustrated. Like just give all that up, like, and why, and then how. Love that. Um, but it's, it's a long process because we, we took one round of it where I had a ghostwriter write a proposal. I got an offer like, but in the end, I actually wasn't happy with the way mm -hmm. we described the book. And then I said to my agent, you know what? I just got to do it. Cause there's just this nuance that, mm -hmm. So then I'm a complete roadblock because I don't have very much time to work on it. But I'm working on it. We are working on it. It just don't hold your breath. I and I've been saying that for like two or three years. So. Well, you said you do have a little perfectionism in you. So I guess that, you know, you, you it's it's difficult to put your name and, and create because your books are beautiful. This market mind game is, I mean, a work of art. It's a beautiful book. Amazing. It's really Thank like you. a Bible for people in trading. And I recommend it for everyone. So with that type of level of book, you know, I understand that you, it, it's a lot to take on because you have a, you know, you, you really create a great book. And, well, I want to you know, get it right. I, I want exactly. what I'm saying to be as right as possible, but also in a language that someone can get it because, you know, it's so obvious to me that people are doing things based on how they expect to feel. Mm -hmm. But it's like really easy for me to say that and see it. It's another thing for me to communicate to someone who's coming from a completely different point of view. Mm -hmm. I mean, I literally will give a talk and it's all this. And someone will raise their hand and say, how can I control my emotions? And I'll be like, you just missed the whole thing. <laughs> but then I think I must have not like said that. I mean, it's not, and not that I'm necessarily blaming myself, but I'm like, there's something else I have to do that I didn't get that. Like, I think they that, heard you. But they're just, it's so ingrained and conditioned yeah. so deep right. in their core that they're trying to put together what you said with what their deep belief yeah. is. Right, 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 right. Like they don't have the context. They don't have the lattice work to like, yes. to, to, yeah. I, yeah, that's true. Yeah, but you're awesome. Well, thank you so much for everything, Denise. I look forward to meeting you again one day. And uh, thank you so much to all the listeners and thank you. Thanks for having me. Take care.